a good way to cope if you're in, in emotional stress. A lot of the answers to your life are in the questions that you ask. In other words, where you set your focus. So um, a great question to ask yourself is what else could this mean? Because sometimes we jump to the wrong conclusion and we think, oh my God, it's because of this or I'm such a loser or whatever. So to refocus our mind by using very clever questions is a great way to do it. Shifting your physiology is a great way to do it. You know, I know so many traders I've trained over the last, what, 17 years who will lose money the day before and their shoulders are down, they're kind of locked into their screen. There's this kind of anchored physiology of pain, of stress, that the next day they go to the screen, they go straight back to it and they feel the same emotions coursing through their body and they're in that state again. And you can't operate well from a lousy state, it's impossible. So just having some routines and some rituals to get yourself into a great state, breathing deeply, hydrating yourself, keeping fit and healthy, uh, focusing your mind on your outcome for the day, trading to your plan, are all great things to set yourself up to, uh, to win. But if you are already finding yourself in, emo in emotional turmoil, there's been times in your life when um, you've been empowered and there's been times in your life where you've been disempowered. There's been times in your life where you've done things where you, which has made you proud and there's obviously been times in your life where you've done things which obviously has made you ashamed. If you go to the ones where you're were most proud, and proud means when you're using your God-given resources to do something effective rather than ego, which is when you try and take credit for something you didn't really do. Pride, there's a submodality to it, to pride. What do I mean by a submodality? Well, we experience the world in, in three different guises. Visually, what we see, auditory, what we hear, and as we know, kinesthetic, what we feel. That's been known in the area of neuroscience and neurolinguistics and neuroassociative conditioning for many years, that we experience the world in a variety of visual, auditory, and kinesthetic modes or submodalities. There is a formula, like there is to anything else, there is a formula to you and your more empowered state, and there's a formula to you in your disempowered state. So being able to take yourself back to a time when you were on your A game, as opposed to on your D game, and remembering what you saw, what you heard, and how you felt, and answering like what you saw, was it something you saw in your mind, or was it something you physically saw around you? Was it something you heard in your head like words, or was it something you heard somebody say, or a noise, or a sound? Was it a feeling you had in your body, or did you just feel a certain way, or did somebody touch you, or did you, were you driving something, or touching a computer, what was it? But if you can get down to what those submodalities are, and organize them very much like the recipe to making a cake, and then create an anchor from that, and I just did this with a bunch of um, kids out in the Philippines, who were in, were in, let's say, an unresourceful state, and I took them back to a period of time, and I do this with traders all the time, you do a closed eye process, take them back to a time where they were proud, where they were most empowered. What did they see consistently at that time? What did they hear consistently at that time? And what did they feel consistently? And some of us experience life more visually, some of us experience life more kind of kinesthetically, and some of us experience more life auditory or a combination of all of the three. But what it is, and you kind of get down to what those submodalities were that make up the, the, the formula of, of that recipe and then you get them to anchor it and the nice way to anchor is imagine you have like a ball in your hand and you say okay so I take myself back to a, like I remember my first one was when I won this Professor Lanning prize because I figured out the formula of how to get a first at university and it was what did I remember hearing I remember all my mates and I remember hearing uh, my mates clapping I remember seeing all my friends who remembered me from my first year at university when we were just partying constantly totally on the piss, having a great time, looking at me going, holy fuck, Secker's just taken the Professor Lamming Prize. How the hell did he do that? Well, to me, I bloody did it. I bloody worked my fucking tail off. I was disciplined like hell. I had a structured way of doing it, and I figured out the formula for how to get a first, and I was interested in it. And I applied that same technique to the trading world. I figured out the formula that worked, I got really impassioned by it, found something I enjoyed in it, structured it. And then the times that I've ever kind of felt myself doubting myself, which we've all had, that concept of doubting yourself, you know, when you look at yourself like you're small, is putting yourself back into that state of when you were most empowered. 
And if you can do the homework up front, which is take yourself to the state when you were most empowered. For me, it was winning that award, seeing my mates going, holy fuck, Sek has won that award, seeing their faces, this was at University of Nottingham back in the 90s and seeing that. And then I anchor, imagine it's like a ball in my hand, like a snooker ball and it's black and it's shiny and I anchor it and I say a word. Then at any time when I'm in a really low state, and I'm feeling like I'm, I'm questioning myself, take myself back to that place, black ball in my hand, and that will fire off those same emotions because we are a big bag of chemicals in our body with, a, with an electrical nervous system running through it. And by anchoring and then triggering that anchor, very quickly I can get myself back in that state. In the same way you can have an argument with your spouse and come home the next day and just see her or his face and go, ooh, because the last thing you remember is being in a heightened emotional state arguing with that person. Then you see their face again, you're like, why do I feel angry right now? Or why do I feel upset right now? Or why do I feel this way right now? Well, because you just got yourself anchored to the thing that was consistent when you were in a heightened emotional state, which was either love or anxiety or stress, was that person's face. That's how our brains work. Our brains work, you know, Pavlov, uh, identified this. Ivan Pavlov identified this, uh, you know, what, over a hundred years ago where he fed dogs and rang a bell, fed dogs, rang a bell, then he just rang a bell and the dog's mouth started foaming in preparation for digestion because they'd become hardwired. And that's how we are, we are click were. Click were, you know, meaning that we, uh, that we do become anchored. When we put ourselves in a heightened emotional state, either down or up, and something happens consistently, the brain neuroassociates that stimuli with that response. So knowing that, if you find yourself in a state where you are compromised, where you are overwhelmed, where you can't cope, where you're at breakneck point, if you've done the work up front where you've managed to get yourself anchored to one of your most empowered states and then you fire that anchor off, you re-trigger it, you'll find that the emotional state will override the one of disempowerment and you'll be able to move forward. It does require doing the work up front.